Yeah, you put it on again. Okay, thanks. Well, delighted to be here. And as you can see, um, I'm going to be, I'm advertising the subject of my talk. This is called Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric, the world's most iconic mushroom. Um, you know, you can find it on greeting cards. You know, you can find it in gardens with gnomes sitting on it, fluffy pillows. Uh, this would provide you with. Uh, a word of warning at, to begin with. I'm going to talk about this mushroom. Gordon Wasson, the ethnobotanist, ethnomycologist, referred to it as an entheogen, E-N-T-H-E-O-G-E-N, -E -E which is his way of trying to get around the fact that it might be considered somewhat hallucinogenic. He wanted another word that sounded more scientific, and he came up with one that sounded more abstruse. Don't, in the Northeast, which is where we happen to be at the moment, don't go picking what you think is this mushroom, because you won't find it here except in rare instances. And you will find one that has a yellowish cap, a dark yellowish bordering on reddish cap, and if you go out and you consume that, um, you will suffer from uh, some stomach distress that I do not recommend, uh, and the trip you might make might be to the local hospital, which may not be the place you intended to go when you first consume the mushroom. Uh, it's very different. It has different percentages of alkaloids, and that's why the results are different. But I ought to add to this as well. When you're talking about mushrooms and mushrooms uh, giving you certain entheogenic experiences, each one of the same species might be somewhat different. So, um, just as a so-called death cap, uh, which we do have here in small quantities, uh, a person who eats one might end up uh, experiencing his future on the uh, other side of the grave. A person who eats another might just have minor, minor problems because uh, the compositions of, are different from mushroom to mushroom. Just so it might be with one of these, so it might be with the psilocybe. Uh, so-called magic mushroom, M-A-J-I-C-K. Uh, different ones, we're talking about organisms here, we're not talking about things that were created uh, in order to make people happy. So, having said that, and I'm wondering, we can get this on the full screen, can't we? No, we can't. We can't. So we are, instead of having one large, we have two small images. <laughs> and those will have to qualify. Why can't we get it all on the full screen? We don't have that infrastructure. Oh, we don't have an infrastructure. OK. Well, some of you can look at that, and some of you can look at this. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> All right, in 2004, I've spent a lot of time in the Arctic. Uh, if you really wanted to, we could show two different slides at once. Three? Really? Oh, okay. That might be good. Um, anyway, in 2004, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the Arctic. In 2004, I traveled uh, in an area of Siberia, uh, northeastern Siberia, called Okay, just a second now. All right. Uh, there it is in the upper right-hand corner of this one, the northeastern sector, and curiously in the northeastern sector of this one as well. 
Um, <laughs> right. Um, and it's a very remote area. It was the last place uh, in Russia to be Sovietized. Uh, and I was studying the use of what's called VAPEK, W-A-P-A-K, that uh, Amanita Muscari, among the indigenous people who are known as the Chukchi, C-H-U-K-C-H-I. And uh, let's see. This, uh, again, we have two maps for your perusal. Uh, uh, you see it's on the right to the left of the Bering Strait uh, and bordering the East Siberian Sea. Uh, and it goes all the way from a place called Anadir up around the Chukchi, Chukotka Peninsula and so on. Uh, uh, a remote, treeless, tundra-ridden area. And the Soviets didn't get there until uh, a quite a late time because they didn't realize or they didn't think that there would be resources that they could steal from the indigenous people. Now, uh, the Russians realize that there are all kinds of resources they can steal from them and especially natural gas. So you can go to previously untouched parts of the tundra which were used by reindeer herders for time, since time immemorial and find that their natural gas installations there, screwing things up. Now, here we have two images of Kerkil. Kerkil, we must be aware of who Kerkil is. This is Big Raven, the creator. Uh, God himself, in traditional Chukchi lore, is somewhere down on the totem pole, at the top of which Big Raven sits. He created the world. Now, how did he create the world? Reputedly, by shitting. <laughs> and he shit a vast amount, and this could justify what a lot of you might think of as the things are, everything is shit. Uh, uh, he shat an awful lot, and then he molded his shit into mountains and tundra and all that. He had an enormous amount of power. And then he pissed, uh, and that created the oceans and the lakes. And I said to a Chukchi elder, but birds can't piss. And he looked at me, I think in a rather supercilious way, and said, oh, Kirkil could do anything. <laughs> now, finally, he spat. He just spat. And the result was Vapek, according to traditional Chukchi lore. The result was Vapek. This is the word, the Chukchi word for Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric, this particular mushroom. Um, and he said, this is a prolonged folk tale. He said, I won't tell you, oh man, how to use this organism. He had already created human beings. Uh, shortly after he shat, he shat some more. <laughs> but it was a different kind. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go into this too much. <laughs> but if, you, uh, if I'm invited here to teach a course in scatology, <laughs> um, uh, so they wondered, why did you create that? And he said, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to figure it out for yourself. So they did. Now, what I have here, these are Bronze Age petroglyphs uh, at the mouth of the Pegtamel River. And let's see if we can go back. I don't think, I don't want to go back to that map. Uh, <laughs> You know, or those maps. <laughs> uh, but it's a river facing the East Siberian Sea. It's a big river, and there are these giant cliffs with these petroglyphs of mushroom headed people. Uh, and it is assumed, these are 3,000, 4,000 years old, it is assumed that this, it, these are meant to be Amanita muscaria heads. Um, and uh, 
you know, and this is, this is an attempt to uh, memorialize, celebrate, or something, the ongoing use of this mushroom for ritualistic purposes. Now here is, here is another image uh, of the same, and you can see more clearly than uh, etch, it's etched in stone, here how these indeed resemble mushrooms. And uh, I was initially going to show or screen a film called Pectamel, uh, but I arrived the wrong day and films aren't being screened today. Um, and it's a 33 minute ethnographic film by a friend of mine, a Russian filmmaker named Vladimir Golevnev, who hung out in the late 90s with the Trukchi and filmed them uh, using Amanita muscaria um, and mostly old people. And I hung out with mostly old people, too. We'll get on to that in a while. Um, but it's a superb film. Uh, and you see them doing a lot of things that have since died out in only 15 years. Uh, not, and what he does, and what I think I'm going to do in this talk, is simply connect it within the broader cultural context. So, I'm not just showing, oh, here's an image of this, and here are a bunch of people getting high. Here's an image, here's a bunch of people getting high, so on, which I think is sort of boring. I want to show the larger ecosystem of a culture. So, to, there is a man who is a Chukchi elder who was one of my informants. Um, and uh, he said to me, I was trying to figure out, and he said, we'll tell you about this when we feel like it. Because uh, I was asking, you know, tell me how you guys used to use this, how you use it now, uh, what's some about some of the rituals, because uh, I am, to some extent, an ethnographer. Uh, and he smiled and said, we'll tell you about it when we're ready to tell you about it. Now, behind this statement, uh, to a large extent, there exists this man, Uncle Jose, Joe Stalin, uh, and his regime hated uh, the Chukchi use of Vapak, well, anything individual. It was individual. You, uh, it made people act like individuals rather than members of a kokus, which is a collective farm. Um, and uh, what happened, the shamans would say, yeah, we eat this, and it gives us the feeling of flying. And reputedly, Stalinist henchmen would round up the shamans, put them into an airplane, take the airplane, would go up into the sky, and the cargo door would open, and they would be pushed out. And the, the henchmen would say, well, you say you can fly, okay then fly, and down they would go. And this still exists till there's a certain trauma associated with Stalinism that exists to today, so that when, uh, when people come asking questions, they usually get uh, baffled expressions. No one really likes to communicate uh, uh, anything pertaining to local culture because of the ongoing trauma that was created during the Stalin years. Now, those years ended in the 1953 when Stalin died, but that doesn't mean the memory has ended. It's passed on, you could say, genetically. So, I bided my time. Um, instead of going around saying, how do you use this mushroom? I observed the culture. Now, this is a, a common custom called sled jumping. And you jump over a number of sleds that are lined up, uh, and the guy who can do it in the most uh, agile way without landing on a sled, very bad to land on a sled because these are wood and they're made out of driftwood, and you, you know, you smash something, somebody's going to have to cut up another drift log, and it isn't good. So you try to hone your art. Uh, and it's a real art, jumping over sleds. I tried it, and I got over two, and I smashed into the third, and it wasn't good. 
Also, this is a town uh, on the Bering Strait called Uellen, U-E-L-E-N. Uh, they are still doing a lot of sledding with sled dogs there. It's very hard to get gas for snow machines. Uh, this is a traditional Chukchi village uh, uh, that, um, you know, it's, I'm trying to think, no difference between the two images. Uh, uh, and, you know, most of the wood is either imported or it comes from drift logs. Uh, usually the drift logs are not from the Siberian rivers, but from the Mackenzie River getting down into the Bering Strait. Mackenzie is a Canadian river. The logs get up into the Arctic gyre and then come down the coast. Now, here's a guy who's, uh, uh, he's got a binoculars, I think. Yes, he's got a binoculars. He's not looking for mushrooms. Um, rather, he's looking for sea creatures, one of whom might be this. This is an old whale that was, well, it was about a month or so old. Uh, there and you know dogs will come and bite pieces of it and it just lies. There's no place that they don't have a sanitary removal come around. And I must say that that if you know any odor that you might compare it with, uh, this would trump any odor, uh, more odious as it were than any known odor. But most of the meat is gone. Uh, they ate the meat. Uh, blubber is gone. They ate the blubber. Uh, fed some of the inner organs to the dogs and the skin, which they ate too. They don't let things go to waste the way certain people do. Now, uh, in observing the culture, um, this is called Whalebone Alley on an island, a remote place called Idegran Island. Uh, it's a ritual site, a quarter of a mile of raised bowhead rib bones along a corridor, and uh, that's just a small part of them, and uh, no one knows. I mean, these were sort of just before built, uh, maybe by the Chukchi, maybe before the Chukchi. No one quite is certain. They're probably around a thousand years old. They've been carbon dated. Um, it is thought that they were um, built to perform some kind of ritual pertaining to the whales themselves. That is, maybe to let the whales know that they were important aspects of the human diet and, you know, don't, don't uh, leave us, please, oh whales. Uh, this was not known to the outside world until 1976. It's still possible in the Arctic uh, to find remote places and remote sites, uh, although I'm not sure now with, you know, uh, Google Earth and other such uh, devices, whether it would be possible. This would have been probably discovered some time ago. Very, very interesting area and uh, haunting. There I am with uh, a bunch of these whale bones in this foggy atmosphere. So, you know, you might stay, say by now, well, what does this have to do with Vapic? Well, I don't like to think of anything without its context. Mushrooms, for instance, I don't like to think of them uh, without thinking of their habitat, what they're growing on, what they're growing with, what they're doing. It could well be that we don't know, we don't know otherwise, that uh, the uh, Vapek was taken as part of the ritual of people who were maybe wandering through these uh, upright bones. There's no oral evidence of what was going on. So much has been forgotten and lost and will always be lost. Uh, and, you know, it could well be that they have an association with that or not. Um, now, um, do the Chukchi eat this sort of mushroom? Um, only since the Russian takeover in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and like most native people, they never ate mushrooms. They were nomadic. Mushrooms do not provide many calories. If you're constantly on the move, you need a diet of the high calorie content. Mushrooms may give you a high protein content, some mushrooms, but this is taken a picture. This picture was taken in a market in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, not in a market in any 
Chukchi town. Uh, now you find a little bit of mushroom collecting by uh, local people, but not much. Uh, it, it still has not caught on. Um, now, I went out on a lengthy trip with some hunters. Uh, and this uh, rock, it's a beautiful place. Uh, so I was still biding my time, not asking questions about Vopek, waiting till someone volunteered. Very important if you're an ethnographer not to say, oh my God, I'm teaching classes in two weeks. I've got to find out the answer to this question. wrong uh, if that's what you said. This is a place in season rife with mushrooms. Let's see uh, what the next one is. Right, like that. Uh, can you guess what leaf that is? What, what it belongs to? Salix. Ar Arctic willow. Uh, mushrooms are an essential component of any Arctic ecosystem. They grow with plants and trees, all plants and trees. There's a very good reason for this. Um, northern soils, Arctic soils are very acidy uh, and they have a very low nitrogen content. And the underground part, the mycelium, uh, is much better at getting the nitrogen and passing it on to the plant host uh, than the roots of that plant itself, or that tree, and that is a tree, by the way, uh, uh, right there. There's, there's some other trees. It looks like there's a uh, dwarf something or other. It could be, there's a, there used to be. I thought I had some rowans in this. And that's what's called the lexinum. During season, there's more biomass of mushrooms in the Arctic tundra than there is in the northeastern United States anywhere. Less variety more biomass. They're big and they're everywhere and they're very, very important. Um, so, uh, I'm, not, I'm actually smelling it and licking it. I'm not taking a bite out of it. There's a good reason not to. Um, um, of course, there are also Vapex uh, in the tundra. It grows with dwarf birch and dwarf willow. These are dwarf trees. Usually trees in the tundra are about this high, maybe a foot off the ground, a foot and a half maybe, if they're getting a real boost. Um, and a Russian uh, ethno-mycologist, mycologist is someone who studies fungi.
determined that I was not a Russian, not a Stalinist, person, a few Chukchi started telling me about their use of Vapex. Um, they said you shouldn't injure the stem like that, and also like that, <laughs> um, when uh, you're picking it, or you'll end up with a leg injury. They do uh, tend to anthropomorphize this. Also, don't injure the cap. Be very gentle when you're uh, collecting the cap. Don't break it, uh, because if you do, you'll end up with a head injury. Uh, and I was shown, well, actually, I was an old man was hobbling along, and, and he had a leg injury. I was told by one of my informants that he, like a few months earlier, had collected one, and he accidentally broke the stem when he was collecting. He didn't think anything else of it. Uh, and the next day, his tractor fell over, and he had a bad leg injury. And uh, I don't know if this was true. I tried to talk to him. And I, I, know, uh, know, I know very little Chukchi. Some of these people speak of their dialect of uh, Inuit that I know, Yupik. And uh, I was trying to communicate, saying, did you, do you think that that could have been a coincidence rather than the Vapek taking revenge on you? But I couldn't get very far. Now. This is a decadent foodie thing to do with Amanita muscaria or Vapic. You don't do it. Uh, you might end up with an edible, but that's not the point of uh, what you are collecting it for, at least in Chukotka, maybe elsewhere, you know, in Santa Cruz, California, perhaps. Um, no, you dry it. You don't eat it fresh and saute it. You simply dry it. And you sting it together. I think I got three there. Nope, I got six. <laughs> um, you string it together in threes because that's the usual dose, three. It's very bad juju uh, to eat an even number of Vapix. I have no idea why. But I know why they're dried, and it's significant. In 1967, chemists at the University of Zurich found that Amanita muscaria, it contains an alkaloid called ibotenic acid and another called muscosome. And upon drying, decarboxylation uh, renders ibotenic acid into a substance called muscimol. Muscimol. That's a important one for you to know if you're contemplating this particular mushroom. Ibotenic acid is very weakly hallucinogenic. Also, it's not very weakly uh, taken in by your stomach. Uh, so you could end up feeling nauseous. But muscimol dried specimens are not at all weak. So this is, this is one of the uh, last shamans uh, in Chukotka. Uh, and rumor has it that only shamans would eat vapex, after which their constituents would drink the shamanic urine. Because muscamol, this is important, primary, primary trip-inducing alkaloid. It passes through your system unaltered. So if you are drinking this uh, from someone who's eaten it, you get somewhat the same experience that that person who's eaten it has gotten, only in a liquefied form. Uh, but the truth is, as I discovered going around the coast and going into the interior of Chukotka, 
customs and rituals vary from locale to locale, as they would if you're collecting information of an ethnographic nature anywhere. Um, so here are some ex examples that I wrote down. Uh, only shamans should eat vapax. Only old people should eat vapax. Anyone should eat vapax, even kids. <laughs> Only men can eat it after it's been chewed by a woman. You eat it and it transports you to your ancestors. Um, no, you don't even get to your ancestors. It can't transport you that far. You eat it and you make requests of it, like, oh, vapak, dear vapak, stop my nose from bleeding. <laughs> And I don't know quite the reason for this, but there are a lot of bloody noses, bleeding noses, not bloody noses, in Trukotka. Um, then another, well, we continue on. You drink the urine of a shaman or shamaness, yes, but before you drink it, you must swab your skin with some of it, or the vapic spirit will be trapped inside you and that it won't appreciate, it will find a way to revenge itself upon you. And then someone said, hey, nothing more ridiculous than swabbing your skin with your own urine. Uh, so, lots of reasons. Uh, lots of, lots of uh, examples of how it's used and who is using it. Now, Here's, I know what you're dying to ask me. Uh, what is the effect of VAPIC? Um, well, one thing I can say generally is it increases the nimbleness in some people and it slows others down. Uh, I'm not sure that it makes uh, anyone have double vision and see two eagles where there is only one, but it's possible. Uh, one guy told me, that my life would wane, like the moon itself waning, unless after taking, eating vapic, I showed my bare buttocks to the moon. <laughs> so I didn't want my life to wane. <laughs> so I did exactly this, and there were a bunch of people gathered around. They burst into riotous laughter. <laughs> This was a joke. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but laughter is one of the ingredients of uh, the uh, Vapic experience. You do feel lighthearted, or at least I have, or you feel euphoric. It's a very different result from the indole-based hallucinogens like uh, psilocybin and LSD. Very different. Now, the Chukchi say that it makes you feel like you're flying through the air like an eagle, or even like two eagles, uh, and that shamans would fly off and visit their ancestors um, and try to get answers to some big questions, whatever those big questions are. Or if there was someone like in the immediate area who was sick and the shaman didn't know, it was assumed the people of the past were more knowledgeable than the people of the present. And that shaman would go and get in touch with a great, great grand person and say, um, what's making poor little Vladimir vomit all the time? So they would come back with the answer. But truth to tell, uh, the use of this of other customs in decline elsewhere in the Arctic in a very, very short time. Uh, one of the things that's helped their decline is, for instance, the fact that computers are ubiquitous. Uh, if you want an answer to a big question, you just boot up your computer and Google something and you'll have the answer. 
Uh, that's why you saw almost exclusively old people here. Another 10 years from now, if I go back, you won't see, I won't see anybody, perhaps. But here's my own feeling that, that one's ancestors are wiser, much, much wiser than the internet. Thank you. I have a few copies of this book for sale. Should I uh, 